Right, well, I thought it's about time I started answering some of these questions. So rather than waiting for a proper setup, I picked the cheapest, nappiest camera up I could find in the workshop. I thought I'll have a crack at it myself. Now the first question is a bit of a weird one. And it would seem that a lot of you are having trouble with um, the process of gluing up a workbench leg. Um, and the same trouble, I think, is being represented also into workbench tops, particularly when you're doing a lot of laminations. And this problem is known as delamination. And that's when these great big face-to-face -face laminations start to break apart, start peeling open, the glue line fails. Um, and I think what people are wanting to know is what to do about it when it happens, and also what can you do to prevent it. Now, strangely enough, um, it's a really quite simple way of fixing this or preventing this from even happening. There's just a simple formula that I like to follow that pretty much guarantees this isn't going to happen. Um, so I'll probably dig out a couple of bits of wood in a minute and we'll glue up a leg and go through how I would go about it. Then you can replicate it. And then we'll have a bit of a natter while the glue dries about what I'd do if it had actually already happened and you know how you can fix it. I think that's gonna bloody work. I'm gonna have to strap you to something. All right, so what I've dug out here, the two bits of pine, um, it's redwood to be particular. Now redwood makes excellent workbenches and it glues really well. It's really quite heavy um, and stiff. And it's good stuff. Now this method that we're gonna use is um, what's known as face-to-face -face laminating. So that's where we're basically just gonna take Two boards, cake them in glue, sandwich them together and put some clamps on it. Um, and then when we take the clamps off, we've got a thicker bit of wood. And it's pretty simple. Um, now, the problem is a lot of people confuse this because this isn't a very um, common joint in furniture making. It's not often you're doing this. You know, if you build a workbench every now and then, then that's about the only time you're doing it. So it doesn't get much practice. But in theory, it gets confused with what's known as edge joints. And that's where you probably slap some glue on the edges, stick it together, and jobs are good. And now, edge joints are bulletproof. You know, they're in fact they're, they're that good that you can get a good planed edge, put some glue on it, slap the other bit on, rub it about a bit for the rub joint. Go off and have a cup of tea, come back, and the bloody thing will stay together forever. Um, but it's very different to a face-to-face -face joint. Um, now, the reason edge joints are so good is because of all this long grain. Long grain to long grain, tremendous amount of surface area. So you'd think that that will transfer even more so to these face-to-face -face joints, but that's actually not how it goes. Because when you go face-to-face, what you've then got to deal with, with this huge span, is a lot of stresses with timber movement. Because what happens with wood, uh, let me just get a pen or a pencil, is as this leg dries, it's basically going to be half inch all the way around. And within that, it's going to be doing this drying out, taking moisture on, drying out, etc. And it never really stays in that same humidity for long enough for it to really penetrate to the middle and uh, in fact I've had I've had sleepers and oak tops that I've made where they've been solid slapped one big slap of wood and I've had these things kicking around for 15 years or so and there was bloody 15 years old prior to that you cut them and it's still wet through inside you know so sometimes these big thick lumps they never truly dry um, not until it starts to crack at least so what happens is, with all of this expansion and contraction, is it causes essentially the failure to happen on the outside. And then once you've got that hairline started, you know, and it starts to run, every time it does it, it just weakens it and weakens it. You know, it's a bit like um, how you see boulders breaking off cliffs and stuff. You know, they get a little crack in it and the water gets in. 
it bloody freezes and expands a bit and breaks it a bit more and then year on year that keeps happening until the old bloody side falls off so it's, it's a very similar premise so what we've got to do is get our head around the fact that these two bits want to move and we can actually deal with it in a very simple way and that is all about positioning these growth rings in the right orientation because as it dries those curves want to straighten out so we need to position them not like that let me try and figure it quick so if we position them like this where they are against each other as those two rings start to dry out and straighten they will tighten and remain tight in these joints and something as trivial and as simple as that is the difference between often a failed joint and one that lasts forever as a general rule as wood dries the growth rings in the end grain straighten as a result you get caught in the opposite direction to the growth rings imagine they're a bit like elastic bands by putting the rings together almost as there would be in a tree you're much more likely to have a failed glue line by opposing them though you're stacking things in your favour as the movement isn't going to pull at the glue line now every now and then I come across a real pretty face or I have something ugly to hide in that case I will sometimes stack the rings in the same direction this doesn't work for you but at least it doesn't work against you this is of course all very generalised extreme environments may require different approaches Once I've got the surface knocked down, I then move to prepping these surfaces in a very particular way. Using stock shavings, I plane a slight hollow along the length. I'm also constantly monitoring the cup. We want a cup. I use a couple of sticks to check the twist and sort any out by knocking the eye corners down. That cup and hollow really help here. Then it all gets just a nice swipe over just to tie it all together. Well that only took a few minutes, it really is just a skim up. So what I did is I just knocked it all down and put a nice spring in it and then ensured it had a cup going across, just a slight cup. Um, and then we just got it out of twist. And a twist doesn't need to be stupidly precise, you know, just somewhat like. Um, and then I just took that even shaving all the way across it just to sort of bring it all in flat and true. So by the time it's finished, it really is just a minimal um, spring, minimal cup. The cup is very important. And then just somewhat like out of twist. So what I'm gonna do is the same on the other one and then we'll uh, stick them together. With the second bit done, we're ready for a check. By sandwiching them together, you can see what you're up against. 
Now what you want is for the ends to be tight, but a slight gap or spring in the center. You can see how easy it is to press that spring out. On that end grain view, you can also see the small gap in the middle, left from the cut we planed in. This guarantees that the edges are pressed tight together in the clamps. All right then, so the last thing I like to do, um, this is more of a precaution, but I do think it pays, and that is just to scuff it up a bit, the, frame, the plain surface with some sandpaper. Um, well, all that's to do really is, um, well, there's two things. First off, when you're hand plane, it has a, a heavy burnishing effect. And that burnishing can sometimes make it quite hard for glue to penetrate. Um, and the other is I uh, wax the L out with salt. So um, there's always that concern of does some of that transfer onto the work. So it's a very quick procedure, so we may as well do it. And um, just like everything, there's always a, a way. So it's got a bit of coarse sandpaper. I'll just fold it up. So by hand, way too big. I'm just going to sand within sort of half inch from the edges. I don't want to go over the edges because if I start to round them over it, it can look a bit of a sod basically. We'll have um, gaps before we even start. So all I'm going to do is just scuff it up lightly. all it needs just opens the pores up a little bit and then to get those remaining bits just get a bit of stick something with a flattish face and just wrap it and then we can just bridge it the, the point to the point send a few over and I'll do it and that's it. It's basically just opened up the grain. I'll do the other one and we can slap some glue on it. Alright then, we're on to the glue up. Now this is a fairly simple job. We've just got to put enough on it to cover the whole area and then it squeezes out well. Now I am going to be quite particular on the glue that I'd recommend you use. Um, and there are far better two-part glues and mess about glues, but we don't want any of that. I want to just recommend something simple that you can get out of a bottle and squirt it on the bloody work and job to good them. Um, and that's going to be a D3 or a D4 PVA. The reason I like it is it doesn't set hard. It, it kind of almost maintains a slight rubbery compound. Um, and as a result, it doesn't crack under the amount of movement that this stuff might want to do. And um, once you get that crack, that's when you start to get the failure. So it's relatively crack resistant. That's why I like it. So um, it's up to you, obviously, what glue you use. They all say to do it, but that without question has been the best one part glue I've used. So what we'll do, just squirt a load on. I've shown my big posh glue roller one day that I've got just for doing laminates. It's 
rubbing about and if it ain't all coming out and you just put more on you can see how it's bit already you know you can't actually get it a bit have a bit more that'll do us so you can see the pattern i've kind of used there i put a squirty bit along zigzaggy and then i rub it together but then i always like to just put a film like a full bead along the edges that just guarantees a seal there because you can uh, brush it if you like I don't like them rollers those rollers tend to spread it a bit thin Gonna get the ends flushed off and then I'll show you why I like them at the same length. The stapler. Now what I do, if they're any short, is I just bang a few in the end. Like that. So it just bridges the joint, and all that's doing is it's going to stop it doing that slidey thing when you put the clamps on it. And it makes a huge difference. And you can throw it about and all sorts. And if I was machining these out, so let's just say I planed these on a planer, I would always do the hand planing as well in, in the joint, just getting that little scoop in the right direction. But when your pieces are parallel, you're able to now stack them, and then that makes clamping much easier. You know, you'd have to do one at a time. Let's bring you around just to see a bit better then. So while that's drying, I thought I'd go through what I'd do if your joint basically already shagged. So let's just say your workbench top, it started to open up a little bit. What would I do about that? Well, 99% of the time, it's not going to really progress into something that's going to cause damage to the top. It's not going to work. It's not going to just fall to bits. You know, there's a lot of area there that will stay stuck. It's just visually ugly. So in that case, all I'd actually do is I'd basically if I turn you around if if this was my glue line here and let's just say that that had started to open up I'd just bung that up with a bit of tape or something to stop the the epoxy running out and then I'd just pour thin epoxy into there and just let it build up and then once it's set you can just plane it down and uh, re-flatten your top or whatever and if it was on a workbench leg um, it's a bit more of a nuisance because you ain't got gravity working in your favour. Basically, you're working on the vertical. So I've just put a bit of a thickener. And you can buy it like cotton wool and all sorts to thicken up epoxy. And you just want to make it thick enough where it doesn't run. And probably works out better as well to use some of this fast setting so gravity ain't got time to be a pig. And then I'd get a soft bendy spatula and just keep working it into the joint. Um, until it's really filled up and then again just plane it back or sand it back or whatever and that'll just reseal it and that's all you're trying to do really is you're just trying to block up the crack the fracture that's letting the air in because once that air gets in that's why the wood's doing the moving and once that's sealed up the jobs are good and so i'll let that set up and then we'll come back another day or something and we'll plane it up and i'll show you how to square a leg up if, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. 